Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are covering chapter 4 from our Microbiology, a Systems Approach uh, book uh, by Cohen, 7th edition. This chapter covers bacteria and archaea, so let's go ahead and get started. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, a Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, explain stuff. All right, to start, please remember that bacteria and archaea, they are prokaryotes, and so they do not have a nucleus. Instead, they have what's known as nucleoid. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, they have their chromosomes inside of a double membrane called the nucleus. That's the main difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes, the presence of a nucleus as well as the presence of other membrane-bound organelles. Eukaryotes have membrane-bound organelles, prokaryotes don't. Membrane-bound organelles include the main one, the nucleus, but also other membrane-bound organelles, including you know, the mitochondria, the chloroplasts, the Golgi apparatus, the endoplasmic reticulum, vacuoles. All of these are membrane-bound organelles. And bacteria and archaea, they lack these structures. They do have chromosomes, right? Bacteria and archaea, they typically have, remember, one circularized chromosome. Um, but they that DNA that chromosome is floating around in the cytoplasm as a structure known as the nucleoid. And here in this figure, you can see a typical prokaryotic cell. This is a bacterial cell, a typical bacterial cell. In it, you see the fluid. This blue fluid is the cytoplasm, which is this fluid inside of the cell. And this stringy stuff, you see these purple string, that's the nucleoid. That is the DNA. And remember, the nucleoid is usually a single circularized chromosome. And it's all packaged up into this nucleoid structure. So if I were to take this stringy stuff out, that DNA out, and untangle it, it would really have no beginning and no end. It would be a closed circle of double-strand DNA. These other little dots here, you see these little blue dots? These represent ribosomes. Bacteria, archaea, and eukarya all have ribosomes. All cells have ribosomes. Ribosomes are there for synthesizing proteins. They're essential for making proteins. As well, um, you know, nor, uh, all cells also have a plasma membrane. See this in gold here? That's the plasma membrane. All cells have some kind of plasma membrane. But bacteria in particular, check this out, bacteria have a cell wall. Usually bacteria have a cell wall a semi-rigid casing that provides structural support. And that cell wall is made up of a component, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, called peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan makes up the cell wall of bacteria. And by the way, peptidoglycan is unique to bacteria. That means only the domain bacteria have peptidoglycan cell walls. Then there could be additional layers. There could be outer membranes. There could be additional layers. There could be capsules. There could be all kinds of stuff on the surface of the cell. And we're going to talk about all these structures. They could be fimbriae on the outside of the cell. This look like these little hairs. There could be flagellum. You see like a flagellum, a prokaryotic flagellum. So these are typical structures inside of a prokaryotic cell. There can also be what are known as inclusions, which are storage areas inside of the cell. There could be plasmids, little circular DNA inside of the cell. There could be all kinds of structures inside of a typical prokaryotic cell. And that's the purpose of this chapter. We're going to delve into this uh, prokaryotic cell. And we're going to talk about all the typical structures inside of 
prokaryotic cells. Specifically, we're going to focus on bacterial cells. And of course, bacteria are alive. Bacteria, they comprise one of the three domains of life. They are single cell organisms fully capable of reproduction, metabolism, nutrient processing, and more. All of the characteristics of life. Bacteria can even act as a group. Sometimes bacteria can form colonies. They can form biofilms, which are communities. And we'll talk about these biofilms in a little bit. And being prokaryotic in nature, these bacteria are very small. They are an average of one micrometer in diameter. Now, some bacterium, they can range, you know, a typical bacterium is between one and let's say five micrometers in diameter. And that's about 10 times to 50 times smaller than the average eukaryotic cell. Eukaryotes are about 10 to 50 micrometers in diameter. However, these bacteria, they can vary in their size, their shape, and their arrangement as well. And we're going to touch on that. With respect to shape, bacteria have three common shapes. They can be caucus shape, which means spherical, bacillus shape, which means rod shaped, or they could even be spirillum or spiral shaped. Hey, Wicket. Wicket is here to say hi. Uh, he is scratching at the uh, monitor right now. So thanks. Hi. Thanks for the visit, Wicket. <laughs> I always enjoy a visit from Wicket. Oh, gosh. And he's running into things. But <laughs> getting back to bacterial shapes, again, the most common of shapes you're going to find for bacterium are caucus shape, which means spherical, bacillus shape, which means rod shaped, and a spirillum, which means spiral shaped. But that's not the only type of shape where we can have. We can have other shapes as well. Some bacterium can be oval shaped, bean shaped, pointed blocky, spindle-shaped, round with rounded edges. They could be filamentous. There's actually an entire class of bacterium that are filamentous. They have these filamentous cells, kind of like fungi, you know, molds. They can have hyphal cell-shaped. They could be club-shaped or drumstick-shaped. With regard to the spirillum, not only can you have spiral-shaped bacterium, but you can have corkscrew-shaped uh, bacterium, which are full-on spirals. Uh, you could have Vibrio bacterium. Vibrio look like comma, like a comma-shaped. So there are so many different shapes of bacterium out there. But the most common, again, are coccus, bacillus, and spirillum. Now, some bacterium have no shape whatsoever, and these are known as the pleomorphic bacterium. These pleomorphic bacterium, because they lack a cell wall, they don't have a particular shape. So they're going to have various shapes. Now let's talk about arrangement. We talked about shapes, right? The common shapes caucus, bacillus, spirillum. But what about arrangements? Those shapes can adopt various arrangements. So let's talk about these arrangements. Diplo. Diplo is a arrangement which means pair. So if you were to describe a bacterium as diplococci, it would mean that the bacterium hang out as pairs of spherical bacterium. See, so cocci refers to the spheres. Diplo uh, refers to its arrangement. That means pairs of spheres. Tetrads would be groups of four. So, for example, tetrad, uh, you could have a tetrad of cocci. Staphylo. Staphylo. When you see this term, staphylo, you should know that refers to irregular clusters grape-like clusters. So if you see the term staphylococci, this means grape-like clusters of 
spherical cells. The first part of the word, staphylo, refers to the arrangement. The second part of the word, cocci, refers to the shape. Strepto, on the other hand, means chains. Like think of, uh, you know, a pearl necklace. Think of um, forming a chain, forming a row. Uh, streptococci would be bacterium that form a chain of spherical bacterium. And then there are sarcinia. Sarcina are cubal packets, either a cube of eight, a cube of 16, or even more. And these are all different arrangements that cocci can have, that spherical bacterium can have. What about bacilli? Remember, bacilli are rod-shaped bacterium. Bacilli can exist as pairs as well, called diplobacilli. That means a pair of bacilli or rod-shaped cells. Streptobacilli, which is a chain of these cells end-to-end. Palisades, which are these rod-shaped cells, uh, which are side by side. So imagine, you know, strepto is end to end. Palisades are side by side. Spirilla, remember spirilla are these uh, cells that have a curved shape, uh, like a spiral shape. Spirochetes, spirochetes, they have a corkscrew shape. Sometimes you can find spirilla in short chains, but spirochetes are rarely attached to other cells. Now remember, bacteria exist as single cell creatures. However, they can form communities. And remember, in biology, a community consists of various species, different species living together. And in a biofilm, for instance, bacteria that form biofilms, this consists of a community of different species all living together inside of a polysaccharide and sometimes it has polypeptide matrix, a sugary proteinaceous matrix. Think of Think of different bacterium. Take a, pic, take a look at this picture here. You have all these different bacterium all living together in a community, and that community exists in a sugary, protein, proteinaceous secretion that they make. So they secrete this sugar, they secrete this protein, and that makes this gooey surface in which different organisms can live together, and they can help each other, and sometimes it's symbiotic even, they can help each other to grow. So they call these biofilms cooperative associations with organisms of the same species as well as other species of bacteria, even archaea, fungi, and algae. You can have this, this cooperative community. Biofilms are microbial habitats with access to food, water, atmosphere, and other environmental factors that are beneficial to each organism type living there. Best example of a biofilm I can give you are, for instance, the, you know, the biofilm on your teeth. You know, when you, when you, when you don't brush your teeth for a while, they feel a little bit kind of fuzzy. You know, you run your tongue on your teeth and it feels like there's something there. Like it's not so smooth. And that is plaque, right? That's a biofilm. That's a type of biofilm that's forming on the tooth surface. And so that's a community of bacterium that are attaching to the tooth and growing. So how does it work? Let me show you. At first, whoops, at first you have a surface. Let's say this is the surface of your tooth. Different bacterium will attach to the surface of the tooth. These are known as the first colonists. Once they attach, they will secrete that sugar I told you about. Remember, they can they can they can secrete a sugary proteinaceous uh, uh, secretion, which is going to become the biofilm. Next, as cells divide, they form a dense mat bound together by sticky extracellular deposits. These extracellular deposits they're referring to is the sugar. It's this glycocalyx, which is a sugary proteinaceous structure 
And it's imagine being covered in goo and secreting goo. Next thing you know, additional microbes of all different species, remember all different species, even different types of organisms like fungi or algae, they can, at they can attach. They are attracted to this biofilm that's forming. They attach and they create a mature community with complex function. So what does that mean? That means they could almost help each other out. For instance, let me give you an example of how fun this could be. This bacterium, for instance, it might, it might convert nitrate to a waste product nitrite. Now this other organism may convert the nitrite to ammonia. And then the last organism might convert ammonia to nitrogen gas. You see how that would be cooperative? The waste product of one organism might be the necessary nutrient of the next organism. And so you form this community where you're all kind of helping each other out. You're, you, you know, there it's a complex community with intricate, uh, you know, networks of of uh, cooperation going on. And that's what's happening, believe it or not, in on your tooth surface, and why it's so important to brush your teeth. Right? You got to brush your teeth because, you know, once these communities form on the tooth surface. Every time you take in some sugar or you you have a sugary treat, these bacterium, they start secreting acids and they start wearing down that um, enamel of your tooth. So this is why it's so important to brush your teeth all the time because biofilms form on the tooth. Every time you eat sugar, they digest the sugar and make acidic waste products that wear down your tooth enamel. Um, but yeah, scraping these guys off is the only way to do it, right? So you got to scrape them off by brushing. Next, let's talk about bacterial appendages. These are things that hang off the outside of bacteria. Not all bacteria have these appendages, but some do. Two major groups of appendages are the ones that provide motility. So for instance, flagella for motility or an axial filament for motility. We'll discuss these. And then external appendages that provide attachment points or that form channels. These are known as frimbrae, pili, or even nanowires. Now, we're not going to address nanowires in this chapter, but just be aware that they exist. We're going to focus on fimbrae and pili as attachment points. Now, here's a flagella. A flagella, you know, is a long whip-like structure that some bacterium possess, and some bacterium possess numerous flagella, um, but a flagella is there for motility. A flagella consists of this long whip-like tail called the filament. The filament is a long whip-like tail made up of proteins. Long whip-like structure of proteins, flagellin proteins to be specific. That long whip-like structure, the filament, is connected to an L-shaped hook. The hook is what connects the filament to the basal body. The basal body, you could think of it as the motor, the motor part of the flagella, the, the reason the flagella works. And that basal body is embedded into the cell envelope of the bacterial cell. It's embedded into that cell wall of the bacteria. So you see here, these ring-like structures are the basal body of the, of the flagellum. Then you have the hook and the filament. I also want to turn your attention to this blue arrow. You see this blue arrow? It's suggesting rotation, and that's for a good reason. The flagella rotates. It literally spins and spins and spins. Imagine if this ring structure here, the basal body, imagine if it was spinning, right? This The, the hook was spinning around and around and around. The way I, ex ex I explain it is imagine if you attached a, a, a whip to a boat's propeller, right? You attach a whip to a boat's propeller and then you turn on the boat propeller. What would happen to that whip? It would just spin around and around and around, right? So that's how a bacterial flagella works. A bacterial flagella spins and spins and spins thanks to the basal body motors. Isn't that neat? So think of it as a rotary motor. These bacteria, their flagella is spinning and spinning and spinning. And that spinning is what provides the motility. 
And what's interesting is that not all bacteria have a flagella. Some bacteria have no flagella. These bacteria are called atrichous bacterium. These have no flagellum whatsoever. When you see this suffix trichus, you should think flagellar arrangement. So if a bacterium is atrichous, a, the, the prefix a suggests that there's no, you know, or lacking. Atrichous bacteria lack a flagellum while monotrichous bacterium have a single flagellum. And if it's a monotrichous polar flagellum, that single flagellum is attached at one end of the cell. Now, lopotrichous bacterium, they have a small bunch or a tuft of flagellum at one spot. So for instance, look at this character here. Look at this bacterium. You see how it has like three or four flagellum at that one spot, that's known as a tuft. Lopotrichus bacterium have a tuft. They have several flagellum at one particular spot. Amphitrichus bacterium, they have a flagella at both poles of the cell. So they have one at each end of the cell. Peritrichus bacterium, these are superstars in motility because they are completely surrounded with flagellum. So here you can see this character right here. This is a, this right here is a peritrichus, a peritrichus bacterium. It's completely surrounded with flagella. Um, this one here was an, uh, uh, lopotrichus. It has a tuft. It has several flagellum at one spot. Here, you can see a monotrichous bacterium. It has one really large uh, back, uh, flagellum, one large flagellum. So you can see that bacterium have various arrangement of flagella. Some have none, some have one, some have two, some have a tuft, and some are completely surrounded. And so not all bacteria are modal. Some bacteria are not modal once what, whatsoever. Those are the atrichous ones. So what is motility good for? Motility allows the bacterium to move towards nutrients and away from hazards or toxic substances. This is known as chemotaxis. When you see taxis, the suffix taxis, this means directed cell movement, directed cell movement. If it's chemotaxis, we're referring to movement towards or away from a chemical. If it's phototaxis, we're talking about movement towards or away from light, usually towards light. Now look here, chemotaxis, again, this is movement in response to chemical signals. If you're moving towards the chemical, this is known as positive chemotaxis. So imagine there's a favorable chemical such as sugar. The bacterium will move towards the sugar. That's positive chemotaxis. Now, what if there is a repellent or a potentially harmful compound? Let's say there's an antibiotic around, right? The bacterium doesn't want to get anywhere near that toxic compound or that harmful compound. That would be negative chemotaxis because the bacterium could set a course away from that chemical gradient. With phototaxis, some bacterium actually move towards light. Um, especially the photosynthetic bacterium. Remember, there's a whole class of photosynthetic bacterium called the cyanobacteria. These are literally green bacteria. They're green because they photosynthesize and they have chlorophyll inside. So these bacterium would want to move towards light so they can optimize photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, the process by which these photosynthetic organisms produce sugar, using sunlight. Now recall that I said that this flagella works by rotating, but there's more to the story than just that. If the flagella rotates counterclockwise, counterclockwise, this causes the 
bacterium to move in a straight line. This is known as a run. So think about this. If the flagella rotates counterclockwise, the bacteria runs. It moves in a straight line. If it then switches from turning counterclockwise and it turns the other way to, to, to clockwise, this will cause the bacterium to tumble. So the flagellum reverses direction, causing the cell to stop and change course. This causes a tumble. So flagella can either rotate counterclockwise for runs or clockwise for tumbles. So here you can see this would be the typical way that a bacterium moves through substance. Let's say there is some kind of attractant here on the right side and the bacteria starts here on the left side. Notice that the bacteria could run in this straight line. That's because the flagella is moving counterclockwise. And then when the bacteria switches to clockwise rotation, there'll be a tumble where the, where the bacterium tumbles around picking a new direction and then swims clock and then uh, swims uh, straight because of a counterclockwise rotation. And then that's a run. And then another tumble because of clockwise rotation and then another run and then another tumble and a run and a tumble and a run. So because of this bacterium are known, uh, flagellated bacterium are known to exhibit what is known as run and tumble motility. The flagella results in the uh, bacterium running and tumbling, running and tumbling. Every time there's a tumbling event, the bacterium can change directions. And every time there's a run, it moves straight. So this is kind of weird because sometimes, look here, sometimes it looks like the bacterium is running away from the attractant. Remember the attractant is on the right, but it'll figure out that it's moving the wrong way and it'll eventually course correct and move its way towards the attractant. So bacterium, you know, when you look at living bacterium under the microscope, um, when they're swimming around, it may look chaotic, but they will eventually get to the source of the, the chemical that they enjoy. You know, they will get to the source of that sugar or that glucose, but, uh, it's a chaotic, <laughs> it's a chaotic journey. There's a series of runs and tumbles. Um, but overall the bacterium will make their way towards that chemo attracted through positive chemotaxis. So now we have touched on flagella, right? This is a motility uh, associated appendage. But what about the axial filament? What in the world is an axial filament? Let's touch on that next. So an axial filament also provides motility, but this axial filament is very strange. It's, it has to do with flagella, but not in the way you might think. Let me show you something. Look at this cell right here. This cell has flagellum, but those flagellum are wrapped around the body of the bacterium. Notice this. Normally, when you think of a flagellum, what do you think of? You think of a long whip-like tail outside of the cell, right? But imagine if instead of the flagellum being this long whip-like tail outside of the body, imagine if the flagellum was was inside the cell wall and wrapped around your body instead, right? So you have the flagellum wrapped around your body and the flagellum is not hanging out. It's inside of the cell wall. So look at this. Here you have these flagellum that are wrapped around the body of this bacterium. And look, that th those flagellum are known as periplasmic flagella. These flagellum are wrapped around the actual cell, inside of the cell wall, right? Near the cell wall. Now, what does that, uh, what does that cause? Imagine this. So again, look at this. Imagine if the flagella, instead of being a long whip-like structure outside, it's wrapped around my body. 
So when it spins, what does it spin? When the flagella spins, what does it do? Look at this. So this is my best ex explanation, right? When the flagella spins, it also spins me, right? Ooh. You know, look at this. The flagella spins me. And so this is really cool. It imparts a twisting or flexing motion to the cell. Usually you see this with spirochetes, you know, like spiral shaped bacterium. And when the flagellum work, they twist the body of the cell. So think, imagine if you're a spirochete, imagine if you're a spiral shaped bacterium, and then this axial filament is causing the cell to spin, right? Then you can corkscrew, you can corkscrew through mucus. It's called corkscrew motility. Isn't that neat? So a lot of times these spirillum shape or spirochete shaped bacterium that are kind of like corkscrew shaped, they'll have an axial filament. So they they're they're corkscrew shaped because they will literally corkscrew the, through the medium, through the mucus that they live in. Isn't that interesting? So when you think of uh, axial filament, think of corkscrew motility. All right, to keep track, we've talked about flagella and axial filaments, which provide motility. Now we're moving on to appendages that have other functions. We're talking about bimbrae and pili in particular. These provide attachment points or form channels. Let's talk about the fimbriae first. All right, focusing on the fimbria first. The singular is fimbria and the plural are fimbrii. Fimbrii provide adhesion, but not locomotion. These are structures that allow the bacterium to adhere to various surfaces. That means attach to various surfaces. So for instance, I told you about plaque, right? I told you about the bacterium that can attach to your teeth. Well, your tooth is pretty smooth, right? Your tooth is nice, smooth enamel. So how are these flat, how are these, um, how are these bacterium attaching to your teeth? Well, sometimes they can use their fimbrii. Their fimbrii are these short bristle-like structures that allow the bacterium to adhere to the tooth surface, for instance. Let me show you what the fimbria look like. You see here, this is an electron micrograph of various bacterium. And these short bristle-like structures are not flagellum. They're much shorter than flagellum. These structures are fimbrae, and they look like little bristles. And they look like kind of like burrs, you know, like uh, plant burrs. And that's for a good reason. They are very sticky, just like a plant burr. You know, if you've ever been out in the wilderness and you picked up a bunch of burrs um, and they've stuck to your socks or to your pants, you know what I'm talking about? Um, well, fimbrii are very similar to burrs on plants. They allow the bacterium to stick to a variety of surfaces. All right, the last one we're going to talk about, an appendage that has to do with forming a channel. This is known as the pili. Now there are various types of pili, but we're gonna talk about specifically the sex pilus. So what is a pilus? The plural of pilus is pili. Pili provide adhesion, but not locomotion. And the one we're gonna talk about again is called the sex pilus. The sex pilus is a long, rigid, tubular structure made of pilin protein forming the sex pilus. Now imagine a hollow tube of protein that one bacterium, let's say this bacterium right here at the bottom here, imagine this bacterium could make a hollow protein tube that extends, 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 and then it docks onto an adjacent bacterium. It attaches to another bacterium close by. And this bacterium could be the same species or even a different species than the one who made the sex pilus. Uh, so, it, so think of a hollow tube that extends from one bacterium and attaches to another. 
This process is known as conjugation. After the conjugation occurs, after the sex pilus has docked onto a neighbor, there is a partial transfer of DNA from one cell to another. The donor cell, the cell that made the sex pilus, it's the only one that sends genetic information, genes, to the other cell. Imagine that. So you make a hollow tube. Let me zoom in here. You make a hollow tube that docks onto a neighbor. That neighbor may or may not be of your same species of bacterium. You then send that neighbor genes. You can send that neighbor various genes. You can send that neighbor plasmids. You could send that neighbor genomic DNA. You could send that neighbor all kinds of genes. And this is known as horizontal gene transfer. This is a lot different than how humans share genes, right? How do we share genes? How do we pass on our genes? Well, after mating, we have fertile offspring. We have an offspring, a child. And this is known as vertical gene transfer because you're sharing your chromosomes with your child, right? So animals undergo vertical gene transfer. They pass on their genes to their offspring. However, bacterium, they don't have parents, right? Bacterium divide by asexual reproduction. One cell simply divides into two via a process known as binary fission. So how do bacteria share genes? How, how do bacteria share genetic information? Well, they can form the sex pilus, uh, undergo conjugation, transfer genes from the donor cell to the recipient cell. Isn't that neat? And then that recipient might pick up some important genes, some helpful genes like antibiotic resistance genes or toxin genes or even genes that are required for making their own sex pilus. Isn't that neat? So you see why that's called horizontal gene transfer? Because one fully developed bacterium sends genetic information to another fully developed bacterium. That's a lot different than vertical gene transfer, where the genes are transferred from parent to child. Now let's talk about a few surface coatings that prokaryotes exhibit. These surface coatings are, you know, outside of the cell wall of these bacterium and archaea. They can have surface coatings. And again, not all bacterium have a surface coating. Not all archaea have surface coatings. But let's talk about what these surface coatings are. The two types we're going to discuss are S layers and glycocalyx or glycocalyces. S layers are thousands of copies of a single protein linked together outside of the cell. When a bacterium or an archaea has an S layer, this provides them with protection from the environment, and it's only produced in hostile environments. So you typically see organisms that have an S layer. These are organisms that exist in hostile environments. I feel like I have a guest here. Check it out. It's a wicket. Hi, wicket. Wicket, have you come to say hi to your adoring fans? Do you want up in the cabinet? Watch this, you guys. He'll probably go up in the cabinet and sleep in there. I don't know if you guys have ever seen my cabinet open, but sometimes wicket likes to go up there and nest. His nickname is Wiki. Wiki, obviously short for Wicked. Wicked. He knows. He's contemplating it, I can tell. <laughs> what are you doing, Wicked? Go up in your cabinet. Go on, buddy. This is so good. We have a visit from Wicked. I have to take a break. This is our break time with Wicked. So Wicket, he's the one with the spot on his nose. He's a fun little cat. He's motivated by food. He enjoys yummy food. Gizmo's over there in his bed. 
Wicket apparently has left us. Wicket has gone to bed. All right, well, let's continue on. That was a nice little break time with Wicket today. So again, S layers are usually found on organisms that live in hostile environments. So a lot of times you'll find these S layer surface coatings on archaea. Bacteria, they're more likely to have what's known as a glycocalyx. Repeating polysaccharide, that means sugar, subunits that may or may not include protein. Some bacteria might have a slime layer, which is a loosely, uh, it's loosely associated with the cell wall. Some bacterium have what's known as a capsule, which is more tightly associated with the cell wall. Here you can see the difference between a slime layer. Look how loose it is to the cell wall, the cell wall being in, in lilac here. And a capsule, which is a glycocalyx that's more tightly associated with the cell wall. Now, a, a slime layer, it serves to protect the cell from loss of water and nutrients. It can also aid, aid in attachment. Slime layers can aid in attachment to surfaces. A capsule, on the other hand, a capsule is formed by many pathogenic bacterium. These bacteria are protected against your phagocytic white blood cells. These are the white blood cells that are tasked with finding bacteria in your body and destroying them. Imagine if you're covered in goo. Imagine if you're covered in sugar. Well, if you're covered in sugar and you find your way into my body, my white blood cells might get confused by that sugar layer, right? So bacteria that have a capsule my white blood cells have a tough time identifying that bacterium as foreign and destroying it. Isn't that neat? So this is why several uh, highly pathogenic bacterium are the ones that are capsulated because they my immune my immune system has a hard time identifying those cells as foreign. Isn't that neat? It's like a cloaking mechanism. And if you've ever seen a capsule stain, you would know that with a capsule stain, you can see capsulated bacterium because in a capsule stain, the basic dye stains the cell and the acidic dye stains the glass, but the capsule remains unstained because the capsule is non-ionic, which means it doesn't have a charge. Anything that doesn't have a charge is not going to be stained by a basic dye, nor will it be stained with an acidic dye. So if you see bacterium with a halo, that suggests that the bacterium has a capsule. If you do a capsule stain, isn't that neat? So a capsule stain will allow you to identify capsulated bacterium. And it's those capsulated bacterium that confuse your white blood cells, that prevent your macrophages, dendritic cells, or neutrophils, these phagocytic white blood cells, from identifying them as foreign and destroying them. Now, we've talked about appendages. We've talked about these layers outside of the cell. Let's go closer to the cell and talk about the cell envelope. The cell envelope is composed of two or three basic layers. This includes the cytoplasmic membrane. Remember, all cells have a cytoplasmic membrane. Most bacteria have a cell wall. That cell wall is made up of a component called peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan makes up the cell wall, and then some bacterium have an outer membrane as well. The gram-negative bacterium have an outer membrane. This is known as the cell envelope. You have the cell wall, the cytoplasmic membrane, and in gram-negative bacterium, you also have an outer membrane. And together, this cell envelope acts as a single protective unit. Now, let's talk about the cell wall of bacteria some bacterium have this style of cell wall. They have their plasma membrane down here. And outside of that, they have this thick layer 
of this component called peptidoglycan. I'm going to explain what peptidoglycan looks like in a minute, but you should understand that peptidoglycan makes up the cell wall of bacteria. And in a gram positive bacteria, the peptidoglycan is very thick and that peptidoglycan cell wall is directly outside of the plasma membrane. And that's what makes up a gram positive cell wall. On the other hand, look at this cell wall. A gram negative cell wall has a plasma membrane, the cytoplasmic membrane, and a very thin layer of peptidoglycan. You see, this is peptidoglycan. It's a much thinner layer of peptidoglycan, but the gram negatives, in addition to having this thin layer of peptidoglycan, they also have an outer membrane, an outer membrane layer. So instead, it, instead of just having a single plasma membrane, they have the plasma membrane, a thin layer of peptidoglycan, and a whole nother outer membrane as well. This is the key difference between what are known as the gram positive cells versus the gram negative cells. The term gram was from the medical student Hans Christian Graham in his medical school residency in 1884, he developed this staining protocol that was used to differentiate between gram-positive bacterium and gram-negative bacterium, okay? The gram-positive bacterium, later on it was discovered that these gram-positive bacterium have, again, this thick layer of peptidoglycan outside of their plasma membrane. In addition, they have these structures called lipotychoic acids and tychoic acids, which lend a negative charge to the cell wall. These cells stain purple at the end of the gram stain. So when you do a gram stain procedure, these cells are purple. Conversely, the gram negative cell wall, remember the gram negative cell wall? You have a plasma membrane, a thin layer of peptidoglycan, and then a whole nother outer membrane on top of that. And these cells stain pink. These cells stain pink at the end of the gram stain. Again, gram-positive cells stain purple, and gram-negative cells stain pink. And I'll explain why in just a little bit. But first, I'm going to go into more details about the gram-positive cell wall architecture versus the gram-negative cell wall architecture. So first of all, let's talk about the cell wall itself, the bacterial cell wall. I said that it's made up of a component called peptidoglycan. And this is the component that makes up the cell wall of bacteria. This is found in the cell walls of most bacteria. Uh, there are some species of bacteria that lack a cell wall, and those tend to be the pliomorphic bacterium. Remember the ones that don't have a particular cell shape? But peptidoglycan makes up the cell wall of bacterium. By the way, peptidoglycan is unique to bacteria. What does that mean? That means that only bacteria, the domain bacteria, have cell walls comprised of peptidoglycan. No other domain of life has cell walls composed of uh, peptidoglycan. Archaea do not have cell walls of peptidoglycan, though they can have S layers. And eukarya do not have cell walls of peptidoglycan either. It is unique to bacteria. And what does peptidoglycan look like? Peptidoglycan is essentially a chain of sugars, M, G, M, G, M. Um, G stands for N-acetylglucosamine, and M stands for N-acetylmeramic acid. M, G, M, G, M. Each of these is a sugar, right? Mainly a sugar. However, the M's, the M's, which are the N-acetylmeramic acids, not only is there a sugar, but there's a short peptide attached as well, basically a short chain of amino acids, and that short chain of amino acids can cross-link to other chains of these um, uh, peptidoglycan as well. So essentially, what is the peptidoglycan cell wall? 
The peptidoglycan is made up of sugars as well as short peptides. Each of these sugar chains, you see how it's like MG, MG, M. These sugars form spirals, right? They're linked together as polysaccharide spirals. Adjacent spirals will cross-link to one another with these interbridges. You see here, like here is a glycine interbridge. There are also direct interbridges. The short peptide tails hanging off from the sugars will cross-link to adjacent peptide tails. So this gives you a very strong, rigid structure. Peptidoglycan is very strong and rigid because you have these spirals of sugars cross-linked with peptide bonds to adjacent uh, spirals of sugar. And that's what makes up the cell wall of bacteria. Now that you know what peptidoglycan is in a little bit more detail, remember it's mainly sugar, but also some protein in there. We should take a look, a closer look at the gram positive cell wall. Remember that the gram positive cell wall consists of the plasma membrane down here with a thick layer of peptidoglycan. And embedded in that thick layer of peptidoglycan are these structures called lipotychoic acids and just regular tychoic acids. These tychoic acids lend a negative charge to the cell wall. See here the functions of tychoic and lipotychoic acids, cell wall maintenance, enlargement during cell division, and acidic charge or negative charge on the cell wall and cell surface. And that's what I want you to know about the gram-positive cell wall, that it has a thick layer of peptidoglycan as well as lipotychoic acids embedded inside. Now turning our attention to gram-negative cell walls, remember here you have a very interesting structure. You have a plasma membrane, of course, all cells have a plasma membrane or cytoplasmic membrane, Outside of that, you have a thin, very thin layer of peptidoglycan. And yet outside of that, remember, you have a whole outer membrane. You have a whole nother membrane outside of that. So it's very interesting how the architecture differs between the gram-negative cell wall and the gram-positive cell wall. A few more things to note. These large structures in the outer membrane of the gram-negative cell wall, these large pores are called porins. Porins are large pores that are formed with these porin proteins that allow substances to enter and exit the outer membrane of the cell wall. Additionally, there are these structures in the outer membrane, the outer part, okay, follow me on this, the outer part of the outer membrane of gram-negative cells. You see how it's drawn in pink? These little spheres are drawn in pink, and you have these little tails hanging off. Well, these little tails are part of what's known as lipopolysaccharides, and these lipopolysaccharides exist only in the, the outer part of the outer membrane of gram-negative cells only. And they're very important. Let me tell you what these uh, lipopolysaccharides are. What are these components of the outer membrane, the outer part of the outer membrane of gram-negative cells only? This is what it looks like. This is lipopolysaccharide, lipopolysaccharide. Remember, these are, these are found in the outer part of the outer membrane of gram-negative cells only. It's a polysaccharide chain which functions as a cell marker and receptor. These, these structures, these structures, okay, have a lipid portion. Look here. This is the lipid portion of LPS. It's a fat. And this is the sugar portion of LPS. There is the O antigen with many sugar units and the core polysaccharide with sugars here. Down here, this is the part that embeds into the outer membrane of the gram-negative cell 
This is known as lipid A. And lipid A is a lipid. It's a fat uh, or, a, or a lipid. And it has fatty acids. This is what embeds into the outer part of the outer membrane of the gram-negative cell wall. Now, what do I need you to know? Again, I need you to know that this structure, LPS, it's made up of an O antigen, a core polysaccharide, and L lipid A. It's found only in the outer part of the outer membrane of gram-negative cells. And something very important that you should know is that the lipid portion of this molecule is called lipid A, and it is called endotoxin. It's very toxic to your body. If this portion of LPS, the lipid A portion of LPS, gets into your system, it can stimulate fever and even septic shock. It can lead to death. So it's very toxic. It's very toxic to you and me. So gram-negative cells are toxic due to lipid A. Lipid A is a portion of that LPS, which exists in the outer part of the outer membrane of gram-negative cells. So again, when we look at these gram-negative cells and we look at these pink, this pink layer here with these tails, that's LPS. And the lipid portion of that is toxic to you and me. Again, for gram negatives, what do I want to know? I want to know with the gram negatives, you have the thin, uh, I'm sorry, you have a plasma membrane, you have a thin layer of potato glycan. Outside of that, you have an outer membrane, and the outer part of the outer membrane includes LPS or lipopolysaccharides. Those are dangerous because the lipid portion of that lipopolysaccharide is toxic to humans, and there are these large pores called porins in the outer membrane as well, which allow for things to enter and exit the cell with ease. Now again, most bacteria have either a gram-positive cell wall architecture or a gram-negative cell wall architecture, but there are some non-typical cell walls. So for instance, there are bacterium that lack cell wall structure, and those are the pliomorphic bacterium. And then there are they're bacterium that have these mycolic acids in the cell wall. Mycolic acids, also known as cord factor, these are waxy structures in the membrane of the cell, in the, in the cell wall of the cell. And this is a very long chain fatty acid. This is what makes the uh, mycolic acids waxy. It, in, it contributes to the pathogenicity of these organisms. They tend to be disease-causing. And these are known as the acid-fast bacterium. So remember in the lab, we conduct a acid-fast stain. Those acid-fast bacterium are the ones that have mycolic acids in the cell wall. These bacterium tend to be pathogenic, disease-causing. So for instance, the bacterium that cause tuberculosis and leprosy, these are bacterium with mycolic acids in the cell wall. These are acid-fast bacterium. And as I mentioned before, although most bacterium are either gram-positive or gram-negative, some bacterium naturally lack a cell wall. They don't have a cell wall at all. For instance, the mycoplasmas are an example of such organism. They're bacterium that lack a cell wall. So these bacterium don't have a particular shape. Look at this example here in this image. Notice that each of these mycobacterium has a different shape, and that's because they don't have a particular cell wall. And if you don't have a cell wall, you're not going to have a specific cell shape. So what are the functions of the cytoplasmic membrane, you know, the membrane of the cell? In bacteria, not only is the cell membrane selectively permeable, which means you allow nutrients to enter the cell and waste to exit the cell, but you also have energy reactions. This means that ATP is produced at the cell membrane. You know how your mitochondria produces ATP using an electron transport chain and ATP synthase? Well, in bacteria, that stuff is done in the cell membrane. There's an electron transport chain and ATP synthase in the 
plasma membrane in the cell membrane. Obviously, there are numerous electron transport chains and ATP synthesis, synthases. However, that's where ATP is made, at the plasma membrane. So what do we have to keep in mind when we're thinking about gram-positive versus gram-negative bacterium? The outer membrane in gram-negative bacterium makes them more resistant to certain antibiotics or antimicrobial chemicals. The gram-negative bacteria, it's more difficult to inhibit or kill than gram-positive bacteria. Gram-positive bacteria tend to be a little easier to treat, easier to kill off if they cause an infection. Infections with gram-positive bacteria are treated differently than infections with gram-negative bacteria. So it's important to determine whether your infection is caused by a gram-positive bacteria or gram-negative bacteria because the treatment options are different and the best course of action, the best course of treatment may be different. Now let's quickly go through the gram stain and determine how it works. Remember the first step of the gram stain is to add crystal violet, a basic dye, Remember that basic dyes have a positive charge and crystal violet is a basic dye with a positive charge. This means that crystal violet will stick to the negatively charged cell. And crystal violet will stick to not only gram positive cells on the left, but gram negative cells on the right as well. Remember that a gram positive cell wall has a, you know, a gram positive cell has a thick peptidoglycan cell wall and a gram-negative cell has a thin peptidoglycan cell wall. Both cells are stained purple at the first step with crystal violet. Next, grams iodine is added as a mordant. You should know that mordants are substances that keep a dye in place. When you add grams iodine, it complexes with the crystal violet. It complexes with the peptidoglycan meshwork and with crystal violet. And so it makes the dye thicker. Imagine if this is crystal violet. Iodine will complex with crystal violet forming a di-iodine complex. That makes the iodine stay in place with the crystal violet. That makes that crystal violet dye stay in place. It makes the crystal violet less permeable in the cell. It prevents the crystal violet from leaving the cell membrane as easily or as leaving the cell wall as easily. So at this point, both cells, both gram-positive and gram-negative cells, will be purple. Next, we conduct what's known as the alcohol step. This is the decolorizer step. Remember, we add acetone alcohol. Acetone alcohol decolorizes the cells. However, when you add the acetone alcohol, remember you do it in a dropwise fashion at an angle for only 8 to 10 seconds. This allows only the gram-negative cells to clear of, I of the color of the crystal violet iodine complex. The gram-positives retain that color. And so if you do it right, you've cleared the gram-negative cells with the uh, crystal violet but the gram-positive cells retain crystal violet and are still purple. Remember, you could mess up this step pretty easily. If you destain too much, both the gram-positive and the gram-negative cells will appear clear. If you don't destain enough, both the gram-positive and the gram-negative cells will remain purple. So you need to destain just right, kind of like Goldilocks. You need to destain in such a fashion that the gram-negative cells become clear but the gram-positive cells retain the purple color. Next, so at this point, again, at this point, the gram-positive cells appear purple. The gram-negative cells should appear clear. Now, we could take a look at these cells under the microscope, but it would be hard to see the gram-negative cells, so we're going to add a counter stain. The counter stain, also known as the secondary stain, is a stain known as safranin. Safranin is a red dye. And safranin is going to stain all the cells. It's going to stain the gram-negative cells pink. It's also going to stain the gram-positive cells, but because it's so much lighter than the purple color that's already in the gram-positive cells, it's not going to be noticeable. 
So at this point, your gram positive cells should appear purple under the microscope and your gram negative cells should appear pink under the microscope. And that's how the gram stain procedure works, okay? So we add the, again, we add the crystal violet. It stains both gram positives and gram negatives. We add the iodine as a mordant, which keeps the dye in place. We add the decolorizer acetone alcohol. And if you, do, if you add it in the right amount at the right amount of time, you will wash out the gram negative cells, but not the gram positives. And lastly, we will you know, use the counter stain to show the, the gram negative cells as pink. And this is why at the end of Hans Christian Graham's uh, gram stain procedure, gram positives end up purple and gram negatives end up pink. So at this point, we've talked about all of the structures outside of the bacterial cell. What about inside of the bacterial cell? Let's talk about the inside of the bacterial cell. Starting with cytoplasm. Cytoplasm refers to the gelatinous solution contained by a cytoplasmic membrane. It's all of the solution inside of the cell, which is mainly made up of water. Um, it's about 70 to 80% water, and it's the predominant site for the cell's biochemical and synthetic activities. This cytoplasm, uh, you know, I refer to it as the fluid inside of the cell, but it's a complex mixture of sugars, amino acids, and salts. There's also a chromatin body, you know, this. Uh, there's the nucleoid, there are ribosomes floating around in the cytoplasm, granules, and fibers. Here you can see the bacterial chromosomes inside of the cell. Remember that, that bacteria have chromosomes and not plural, but a single circular chromosome. Bacteria have a single circular strand of double strand DNA. And that DNA exists as a tightly coiled uh, complex inside of the cell known as the nucleoid, the nucleoid. There can also be extra chromosomal or non-chromosomal DNA inside of bacteria known as plasmids. Plasmids are not part of the normal chromosome of the cell. These are non-essential pieces of DNA. They're separate double-stranded circles of DNA. They're small. They're small circularized DNAs but they can actually have important genes. They can have important genes that give certain traits to the cell, such as antibiotic resistance genes or toxin genes, or even genes that allow the bacterium to form a sex pilus. Bacteria also have ribosomes, and this is something interesting. Ribosomes are the organelle responsible for synthesizing proteins. The, the ribosome synthesizes proteins. In fact, the ribosome is made up of RNA and protein. Now, what's interesting and what you should know is that the bacterial ribosomes are actually smaller than the eukaryotic ribosomes. Bacterial ribosomes are known as 70S ribosomes, whereas eukaryotic ribosomes are known as 80S ribosomes. S stands for Svedberg or Svedberg units. This is how fast a substance travels through a centrifuge. Okay, so it has to do with centrifugation. Bacteria have smaller uh, ribosomes than eukaryotes. Um, but that doesn't mean they don't do the same function. Ribosomes function the same. Ribosomes function to synthesize proteins. That's what ribosomes do. They make proteins. Bacterial ribosomes make proteins. Eukaryotic ribosomes make proteins. However, the size and the shape vary. And remember, what does a ribosome look like? Ribosomes have a large subunit and a small subunit. And those two subunits can come together I call it a hamburger bun arrangement, right? The hamburger bun. You've got the large bun and the small bun. They can come together. They can come apart. In bacteria, the large subunit is called the 50S subunit, and the small subunit is called the 30S subunit. 
Together, the 50S and the 30S subunits comprise the 70S ribosome. In bacteria, you also have structures called inclusion bodies. Inclusion bodies are storage sites for nutrients during periods of abundance. So let's say that the bacterium finds a source of phosphate, right? Phosphate's a pretty important nutrient for the cell. It can form a little inclusion body, which is a storage site in, inside of the bacterium for phosphate. And it can make these inclusions for various types of nutrients in periods of abundance. Now, some bacteria can form what are known as endospores. And these are some dangerous bacterium. These are bacterium that can form these highly defensive structures called endospores, these defensive uh, seeds. You can think of them as seeds. Endospores can withstand hostile conditions and facilitate survival. And there are basically two genuses of bacterium that can form endospores. You should know that the two genus, the two genuses of, of bacteria that can form endospores are the genus Clostridium and the genus Bacillus. Those two genuses of bacterium can form endospores. And when endospores are formed, the vegetative cell, which is the, you know, the, it's also known as the mother cell. This is the metabolically active cell. The vegetative cell will form the endospore through a process known as sporulation. The endospore is the inert resting condition. It is a dormant seed and it is highly resistant to the environment. And the process by which the vegetative or mother cell will form the endospore is called sporulation. Sporulation refers to spore formation, and this can be induced by environmental conditions. This is an endospore on the right. See how it looks like a seed? The endospore can resist heat, you know, not, not to an infinite degree. You know, autoclaves can still destroy an endospore. Fire can still destroy an endospore, but it's resistant to high levels of heat. For instance, endospores are resistant to boiling conditions. Endospores are resistant to drying out, or what's known as desiccation, drying out or desiccation. Endospores are resistant to freezing conditions. They're resistant to some level of radiation, for example, UV radiation. They're resistant to chemicals, many chemicals, not all chemicals, but most chemicals. These little seeds, these little endospores are highly, highly resistant to the environment. And what causes the endospore to form? Usually it's a depletion of nutrients. So nutrients dip. There is a depletion of nutrients, especially carbon and nitrogen sources. If these bacterium Remember, only the bacterium in the genus Clostridium or the genus Bacillus, if these bacterium are lacking in these carbon sources or nitrogen sources, they can undergo endospore formation. The mother cell will form endospores. The vegetative cell will form endospores. And this refers to the sporangium. The sporangium refers to the sporulating cell, the cell that's making the spore. And transformation can take six to eight hours in most species. So it could take six to eight hours for these endospores to form. Here's the process by which sporulation occurs. It's called the sporulation cycle. So let's go ahead and start from the beginning. In step one, in step one, you can see the vegetative or mother cell begins to be depleted of nutrients. This is a this is the vegetative or mother cell. Somehow it's being depleted of nutrients. So there aren't many nutrients around. There's not, not good food. There's no good source of sugar or food in the environment. So what happens is this triggers sporulation. Notice that this mother cell has its chromosome. This is its nucleoid. It has a cytoplasm. In yellow, it has a cytoplasmic membrane in yellow. In pink or purple, it has the cell wall but it's gonna trigger sporulation. So at, at this point, it's gonna uh, copy the chromosome. The chromosome or nucleoid is duplicated and separated. Next, 
a membrane forms around what's called the four spore. The four spore is going to become the endospore. So you have a copy of the chromosome inside of a membrane. Next, the sporangium engulfs the four spore for further development. This membrane, this membrane engulfs this other four spore. So you end up with two membranes, two membranes surrounding the early endospore. The sporangium begins to actively synthesize endospore layers around the four spore. So there are endospore layers forming around the four spore. Next, a cortex forms, a cortex forms around the four spore. What's a cortex? It's made up of peptidoglycan. Remember, peptidoglycan is that sugary proteinaceous stuff that makes up the cell wall of bacteria. So imagine. This is the four spore. It's DNA surrounded by a plasma membrane and a cortex. The cortex is made of peptidoglycan. Then the mature endospore forms. So the endospore is maturing. And by the way, at this point, the this other copy of the DNA gets degraded. Next, um, other protein layers can actually form on the endospore as well, such as what's called the endospore coat and the exosporium. These are additional layers on top of the endospore that makes it more resistant. The endospore can then lyse out of the cell. It can leave the cell. And when good conditions return, when favorable conditions and nutrients return, the endospore can germinate, releasing the new vegetative cell to start the cycle over again. And again, this is known as the Typical sporulation cycle in a bacillus species, in a spore former. And again, what triggers germination of the endospore? This means that the endospore will grow out. It will uh, germinate. It will hatch, if you will, allowing a new vegetative cell to grow out from the endospore. This occurs when there's exposure to water and a germination agent. A germination agent stimulates the formation of hydrolytic enzymes. These are enzymes that will break down that cortex. Remember, the cortex is peptidoglycan. And then that core can rehydrate, taking up nutrients, and the bacterium will grow out from the endospore. A vegetative cell will form again. This can occur in about an hour and a half. So again, when good conditions, moist and nutrient-rich conditions return, those dormant endospores can germinate and grow out to form vegetative mother cells again. And again, remember, it's the genus Bacillus and the genus Clostridium that are capable of making endospores, only those two genus of bacterium. So for instance, Bacillus and Thracis, the causative agent of anthrax, is a endospore former. Clostridium tetani, which causes tetanus or lockjaw, is an endospore former. Clostridium perforangens, which causes gas gangrene, is an endospore former. Clostridium botulinum, which causes botulism, is an endospore former. And Clostridium difficile, which we talked about, is C. diff, you know, that, that uh, gut bacterium that causes colitis and bloody diarrhea. This is an endospore former. Notice that all of these start with um, Clostridium or Bacillus. Let's ask, let's ask Wicked a question. We haven't asked him a question in this video. So would E. coli be an endospore former? Oh, that's right, Wicked. E. coli is not an endospore former because E stands for Escherichia, and Escherichia is not the right genus. Only Bacillus and Clostridium make endospores. So would uh, Staphylococcus aureus make endospores, Wicket? No, that's right again. Again, Staphylococcus aureus would not make endospores because it's not in the genus Bacillus or Clostridium. Would Streptococcus pyogenes make endospores? Again, no, because those that's not in the genus bacillus or clostridium it's only the genus clostridium or bacillus that make those endospores and again in the medical field in the clinic endospores are a problem 
They are constant intruders where sterility and cleanliness are important. It's the reason why we autoclave our surgical instruments or in the dental office, we autoclave the dental equipment. We cannot just boil water to destroy endospores. We cannot use soap or regular disinfectants to destroy endospores. We need to autoclave the instruments to, to destroy endospores. We have to help protect against endospores entering wounds because this can cause infection. In the food canning industry, we have to prevent endospores from entering canned foods because that can cause uh, the you know, contamination, right? In the last part of this chapter, we're discussing archaea. Remember, archaea are prokaryotic organisms as well in the domain archaea. However, archaea are usually not studied deeply in microbiology courses, and that's because archaea are not known for causing many you know, diseases in humans. Remember one thing, archaea are more closely related to the domain eukarya than they are to the domain bacteria. We discussed that before. You should realize that archaea do not have cell walls of peptidoglycan. Remember, peptidoglycan cell walls are unique to the domain bacteria. Most archaea live in habitats that are extreme. For instance, high or low heat, very salty environments, acidic or basic environments, high pressure environments, and, and low atmosphere environments. And lastly, let's talk about what a species is in a bacterial sense. So when we're talking about a bacterial or archaeal species, we can't refer or define a species the same way as we define species in animals. In animals, a species includes a population that can interbreed and have fertile offspring. But remember, in bacteria, there's no breeding and there's no forming offspring due to breeding. There's no sexual reproduction. So in bacteria, we can't define a species the same way as we define species in animals. So because of that, we need to have a different definition of species. So a bacterial species is defined as a collection of cells where a bacterial cells where which share an overall pattern of similar traits. So for instance, what do we mean by similar traits? So for instance, a trait might be the ability to break down lactose, the ability to break down a hydrogen peroxide, uh, the presence of a gram positive cell wall, the presence of a capsule, the presence of flagellum. Um, all of these are traits. So when you have bacterium that share the same traits, once they share enough traits, you can categorize them as the same species. Now, if that's what a species is, what is a subspecies or a strain or type? These are bacteria of the same species that have differing characteristics. So for instance, there is a strain of E. coli that is capable of making a potent toxin called the Shiga toxin, which it got from the Shigella bacterium, right? And this Shiga toxin makes that strain of E. coli much more dangerous. It's the 0157H7 strain of E. coli. This strain of E. coli is more dangerous than your normal everyday E. coli because it picked up an extra gene from another uh, bacterium, right? So that would be a dangerous pathogenic strain of E. coli. You see how um, a strain would be a member of the same species, but having different characteristics, like the ability to, let's say, produce a toxin or the ability to, I don't know, be uh, resistant to a particular antibiotic. And that's it. That leads to the end of the chapter. Thank you for joining me in the chapter four of this uh, course. Um, hopefully you learned a lot. Let me know in the comment box below if you have any questions about this chapter, and I will catch you guys in the next one. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. 
Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.